This is the pre-assembled Stealth Burner Upgrade Kit from Vividino aka Formbot. It comes out of the box looking exactly like this. Motors, fans, hot end, and all. No assembly required. The plastic parts are FDM 3D printed from glass fiber filled ABS. And oh my, these are some of the nicest looking parts I have ever seen. This is intended to be a drop-in upgrade for the afterburner that comes stock on the Trudon 2.0. If you're new here, let me provide some context. The Trudon is a mostly pre-assembled, fully enclosed, large format Core XY 3D printer, which was inspired by the design of the Voron 2.4. This stealth burner upgrade may be intended for the Trudon, but there'd be nothing stopping you from buying this for a Voron, or really any other printer. And at 65 US dollars for the complete package, you're actually better off buying this and discarding the custom Trudon specific PCB than buying the printed parts and hardware separately. You're paying a bit of a premium as compared to printing the parts and assembling yourself, but not by much. Note that this Formbot stealth burner does not come with LEDs, a probe, or an X end stop limit switch. If you're installing this on a Voron, you can buy the LEDs separately and add them in. On the Trudon, a lack of spare ports on the stock extruder breakout board means you'll have to go without. Unless, of course, you've decided to switch the electronics, at which point that may be an option. The probe is intended to be repurposed from the afterburner, which will soon be removed. This would be a good opportunity to switch to an alternative probing mechanism, like tap or clicky, if that's something you're considering. I've already fitted clicky to my Trudon, a process I'll be covering in a future video. The format stealth burner comes stock with an E3D V6 clone hot end and a hardened steel nozzle. For a few extra dollars, you have the option to upgrade to the Fadus Dragon, Standard, or High Flow. The included Clockwork 2 extruder uses a Moon's NEMA 14 pancake stepper motor, steel sealed bearings, and hardened steel drive gears. All in all, a pretty nice package. The version I received is a pre-production unit, which uses the Clockwork 1 carriage as opposed to the Clockwork 2 carriage. This has caused a bit of confusion, because Clockwork 1 and 2 are the extruder designations. But there are also two versions of the X carriage that use the same naming convention. The Clockwork 1 carriage has the extruder mounting screws enter from the rear, while the Clockwork 2 carriage has the screws enter from the front. Based on feedback from beta testers, all retail units will ship with the newer carriage design. We'll first need to remove the afterburner tool head before mounting the stealth burner. In order to ease the transition, I designed these little belt grabber blocks that will help keep the belts in place and eliminate the need to retension them. To install them, we'll temporarily remove two of the linear rail screws, one on either side of the tool head. We'll replace these with slightly longer screws and tighten down the belt grabbers. Next, we'll begin disassembling the afterburner. We'll need to remove the four screws securing the front faceplate, the two screws on the rear of the carriage, and the two screws securing the hot end housing. I'll then remove the PCB cover, pull up on the extruder, and down on the hot end. You'll need to unplug the X end stop, the probe, and the 16 pin connector. Then the print head can be fully removed. Next, we'll loosen the four screws that secure the carriage to the rail, and the two screws that secure the probe to the carriage. The probe will be removed and repurposed in the stealth burner. The two screws on the left hand side of the carriage hold the two halves together. With those removed, the carriage can be extracted. Comparing the old carriage to the new carriage, you can see that the only difference is a slightly lower placement of the heat set inserts for probe mounting. We'll need to remove the X end stop from the old carriage and install it on the new one. Note that the X end stop wire should be routed through the carriage. We'll then reverse the disassembly steps, starting with the four screws that secure the carriage to the rail. We'll loosely tighten one half first, making sure the belts are pinched by the teeth on the rear of the carriage. Then, feed the belts through on the opposite side and tighten down the four screws. We'll reinstall the probe, then seat the extruder in the carriage. If this were the Clockwork 2 carriage, this is when you'd install the two screws from the front. On this pre-production unit, I'll install them from the rear. Next up is the tool cartridge. In the Clockwork 2 design, we're able to access the top two alignment screws without first removing the extruder, which is a nice improvement over the Clockwork 1, on which these screws are only accessible with the extruder removed. We'll then open the electronics bay door and plug in all of the connectors. The single screw access is another small quality of life improvement over the stock hardware. Finally, we'll plug the fans back in and reinstall the front face. The stealth burner kit also comes with a few extra links to extend your cable chain. I've done away with the cable chains on this machine, opting to use an umbilical cord setup instead. 
I'll cover this mod in further detail in an upcoming video. The umbilical strain relief I designed for the afterburner won't work for the stealth burner, so I hopped into Fusion 360 and designed a new one. After printing, I installed two M3 heatset inserts and screwed the two pieces together with an M3x8 socket head cap screw. This replaces the pre-installed chain anchor, so we'll remove that and install the new one. Add a few zip ties and the mechanical assembly is complete. Before we're ready to start printing, we'll need to make some firmware changes and conduct a few calibration. The procedure will differ depending on whether you're still running the stock RepRap firmware or whether you've made the jump to Clipper. For completeness, I'll demonstrate both. The first thing we'll change is the extruder steps per millimeter. The gear ratio in the Clockwork 2 extruder is 50 to 17, as opposed to 50 to 20 for the Clockwork 1. In Clipper, we'll simply update the gear ratio in the extruder section of our printer config. In RepRap, we'll update line 33 of config.g to change the E steps from 417 to 710. I would then suggest homing the printer and checking to make sure the nozzle is still centered on the Z end stop pin. If it's not, you can update the home XY position in the safe Z home section of printer config in Clipper firmware. In RepRap, update line 8 of AutoZ.G and line 44 of the AutoZ trigger height macro. This is particularly relevant if you're changing to a different hot end. If you're not using AutoZ, you'll also need to recalculate your Z offset. In RepRap firmware, you can follow the procedure as detailed in my beginner's guide video. In Clipper, you can refer to the Voron documentation. For anyone using a clicky probe, you'll also need to lower the position of your dock and update the end stop and dock positions in the clicky config. The final firmware change you may wish to make is increasing the extruder motor current to account for the fact that the new NEMA 14 has a one amp peak current as compared to 0.8 amps on the old motor. Remember that Clipper uses RMS currents, while RepRap uses peak currents. Now that we're done with the firmware changes, it's on to the calibration. We'll run a PID auto-tune on the hot end by sending the indicated commands in the console, being sure to save the config when we're done. Since we've changed the moving mass, we should also recalculate our input shaping variables. In RepRap, you can reprint the series of ringing test towers as detailed in this video. On this clipper Trudon, I'll reattach the accelerometer and initiate the frequency sweep. For more details on this process, check out this video. When I ran this test with the stock afterburner, I noticed a strange anomaly in my Y frequency response graph. It seemed that there was a component of motion in the Z axis when the print head vibrated in Y. This finding was corroborated by at least two other users who reported similar results. So when inspecting the results for the stealth burner, I was pleased to see that this was no longer the case. I was then ready for my first test print. Honestly, I didn't observe a significant difference in print quality between the afterburner and the stealth burner. The main improvement is to part cooling, which we can visualize using a bowl of water. Based on these results, we can see that the stealth burner has considerably more flow than the afterburner. This will manifest as better overhang performance, which you can see here on this Benchy print. If better cooling is what you're after, you may consider just doing the 5015 part cooling upgrade. This too will be the topic of a future video. So there you have it, the Stealth Burner from Vividino, aka Formbot, installed on the Trudon 2.0. I hope you found this video interesting and informative. If you did, please hit that like button and subscribe for more content. All of the files I designed and illustrated in this video will be available for download on Patreon. I'll also upload them to my website under the digital download section for those that prefer a one-time purchase. Thanks in advance for your support. Until next time, my name is Taylor. This is YGK3D. Happy 3D printing.